Hello, everybody. I'll just uh, allow everybody to find their chairs. And very welcome. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm really pleased to welcome you back for this IIEA event. And we're truly delighted to be joined today by Konstantin Egert who will reflect on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the implications this has for Russia. Konstantin will speak for about 20 minutes before going to Q&A with our audience in the usual format. Just a very quick note that Konstantin's connection has been coming and going a little bit. So if there's a little bit of drop off over the course of his remarks, don't worry, he'll be back. As ever during the Q&A portion of our session, please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And we welcome all your questions. We'd ask that you give your name and include any affiliations that you might have that are necessary and to be clear and concise as possible as you can manage with your questions. A reminder finally that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record and you can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Constantine and hand over to him. Konstantin Egart, also known as Konstantin von Egart, is an independent journalist, political analyst, and communications consultant, and Baltic States correspondent and commentator on Russian affairs for Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster. From 1998 until 2009, Konstantin was senior correspondent, then editor-in-chief of the BBC Russian service Moscow Bureau. In 2008, Mr. Egger was, was honored with an MBE by Queen Elizabeth II for his services rendered to the BBC. And he was also awarded with the Commander's Cross of the Order of Merit of Lithuania by President Valdis Adamkus. Mr. Egger, it's a real pleasure to have you here to talk about something so important. And the floor is now yours. Uh, Barry, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a million for gathering here in front of your screens to uh, listen to me again. Thanks to the Institute for the invitation. I'm honored uh, to speak to an Irish audience and um, hope that it will all work out well. Just one um, brief sort of um, uh, note before I start speaking. Uh, everything I say is uh, purely a personal reflection on the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, on Russia's aggression against Ukraine, to be more precise. Um, I do not speak for Deutsche Welle, I do not speak for anyone apart from myself. And uh, so, uh, if controversial, then it's only the controversies that I generate. Uh, and you are you're most welcome to challenge me on, on, on things. And I hope I will say something that... Um, that um, that um, will probably sort of highlight um, uh, my personal experience. I just returned from uh, Ukraine. I returned this night, traveling from Kiev to Vilnius via Moldova, and I spent a week there. So that's my second trip in four months to, to Ukraine. Um, I also have some impressions from that. But let's go back to... To, to 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 the main topic, which is Russia. Now, first and foremost, what I want to say is um, um, a, a purely sort of a military conflict that Russia wages to achieve to attain some kind of specific goals. Uh, it is first and foremost of all Putin's war for his historical legacy. And because of that, Essentially, the war machine and everything that happens uh, on the front depends uh, very, very strongly on Putin himself and his perception of how, how this conflict, how this aggression goes. Uh, personally, I think that uh, it is uh, going to continue for as long as Putin is in the Kremlin. And actually asking this question what are Putin's goals? What does he want? Does he want to take Kherson or does he want to expand the corridor to Mariupol? That is essentially secondary to understanding that this is, uh, for him, a war for Russia he sees as his Russia. 
And um, why so, we can discuss for a long time, whether it's uh, his KGB background, whether it's the fact that he really overread on uh, Ivan Ilyin, Russian sort of proto-fascist uh, 20th century philosopher, whether it's his, uh, what I call a medieval court around him, convincing him that he is the one for Russia. Uh, but I'm absolutely certain that uh, he is going to continue this um, this aggression, this war, until he is satisfied that Ukraine is within his grasp. With a puppet government or totally destroyed or, or whatever, anything in between, but definitely until he is satisfied. And I think that uh, here we can go to, 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 to switch to or move to uh, basically the methods. And what does he hope for 18 plus months after uh, launching the full-scale invasion? Uh, and here I think we need to remember that uh, indeed the war started in February 2014, not now. And for him, it is a continuation of plans for Putin and his regime. Um, it's a continuation of plans they laid down a long time ago. They were probably adapting them and uh, upgrading them, but it is a long story. We did not start on February 24th, uh, 2022. And I think that there is definitely one calculation which uh, the Russians had all along. And that is the demographic advantage that they have over Ukraine. Uh, we do not go, we won't go back now, I don't want to go back now, to discussing why Putin didn't take Kiev in, in three days as he planned and what happened then. I think that these plans were already sort of upgraded and um, and he's continuing his war of attrition against Ukraine uh, because he counts on essentially the, the Russia being four times bigger in terms of population. And I think this is his main hope. And I suppose that uh, this is something that adds up to his political considerations. And his political considerations are such that uh, he also counts on Western fatigue. He also counts on India, China, and the rest of the so-called global South uh, buying enough commodities from him uh, to sustain his um, secret police, to sustain the army, to basically sustain his regime. Uh, and he also, I think, counts on very significant uh, traits of the Russian, Russian society today. And um, I think his calculations are not, uh, they, they are not silly, they are not stupid, they, 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 they are reasonable. Uh, Putin presides over a society that he continuously formed in his image, or rather in the image he wanted, for 23 years. And this shows. Uh, I know that public opinion polls in Russia are a pretty risky thing to discuss, but if you rely on, say, the Levada Center, which is, well, I mean, reasonably good, even in current circumstances, um, then you see very interesting trends. Um, about six weeks ago, uh, the, the, their measurements showed that about 60% of the population actually say they do not follow the wall, probably 63 or something like that. And then about a month ago, three, three weeks ago, um, there, are, there is a new poll saying that I think 48%, if not 52% of Russians support the war and 20 rather support than do not support. So it comes up to nearly 70% of those who in this or that way support the war. And a normal Western mind thinks well, this must be some kind of contradiction. Yeah, there is not. Um, Russian society is completely depoliticized, completely atomized. And when people say they do not follow the war, it is the equivalent of saying we do not want to follow the war because we know it can do nothing about it. And because we rely on the government to tell us what to do, because that's the way we are. That's the way we want to proceed with our lives. And once we are in this mode, 
we you know watch um mushroom conservation videos on uh, on youtube or we go and you know do a barbecue in the park or whatever or, or we drink ourselves to death but i mean essentially we we the russians isolate ourselves from the reality of course when the reality knocks on us with either televisions switched on in our kitchen or an, a poster calling us on on, on the phone we say what the government, we think the government wants us to say. And we know what the government wants us to say because we watch television, because we we use Russian social media. Uh, it's not only, you know, propaganda for the old. It's not only a TV that Russians consume. I mean, they consume Russian social media, which is very popular. The Russian networks, the Russian social media, like Kontakti and Adnaklasniki and stuff like that. Um, so Telegram channels, uh, which the Kremlin uses amazingly well to inform those who are interested in what goes on. So there is a menu for those who are interested, those who really support the war. Uh, so such a society is easy to manipulate. Uh, I would claim, I would, I would venture that Putin is not interested in major patriotic mobilization. Because major patriotic mobilization, is, as let's say the history of the Great War, First World War shows in Russia, uh, quickly turns into its opposite when bodies start to ar arrive en masse. And um, then people start asking questions, especially if they start arriving in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, Novosibirsk, uh, places where you have enough of intelligentsia, enough of people who uh, use other types of social media, uh, places where people know how to protest. So Putin is not interested in that. He's interested in the, exactly the kind of society he has today. He's not going to move it uh, right or left. You will ask, well, what about new recruits? Well, he has enough for now. Uh, he still has a significant prison population. He still has significant numbers of people in small provincial Russian towns and cities uh, small in Russia is anything under 300 to 150,000 people. Uh, that's usually a jump downwards in terms of quality of life, education, uh, economic uh, uh, status, and so on and so forth. So he still has enough people there to lure to this war, to command to go to this war. And frankly speaking, because in Russia there is no law to speak about, he can go for a surreptitious mobilization without calling it mobilization. And I think that this is uh, a huge uh, element of support he has. Another thing that he has, um, by printing money and by using income from the export of commodities to Mr. Modi, Mr. Xi, and Lula, and the rest of the crew, uh he's basically he's reinvented i mean he and his very able economic advisors reinvented russian economy as a militarized economy and militarized economy well let's remember the us in, in world war ii uh, is booming uh if you look at the economic at figures uh that okay russia statistics are not reliable but uh they will not lie to such an extent to say it's if it's a minus it's not a plus i mean so what these this data shows is that there are, there are more jobs for people that produce um, this kind of rough missiles. Uh, hello, Hezbollah um, drones from papier mache. Um, you know, shoelaces, uh, movable kitchens, whatever the army needs. They're working three shifts a day. They're getting money. They're very glad. Another thing, those who go to the front, especially from these sort of um, uh, this, this uh, depressed regions. Uh, okay, they return in zinc boxes, gross dvest in Russian military parlance when they return a body. But uh, this gross dvesti returns with a bonus. The wife, the missus gets uh, 300, three, 3 million rubles, whatever, 100,000 euros. Um, the sons go to the 
Yekaterinburg State Agricultural University, although they would never even dream of going to the local technical school. The family gets a new flat. And all the neighbors say, oh, great, Ivan Petrovich died, but remember, they see how his wife lives now. Maybe we should think about that. This is another contrat social that Putin struck with the masses, and I think that that's going to hold for quite some time. Um, this uh, is something that uh, will change only on two conditions, in my view. Either Russia suffers catastrophic defeat, which is visible, for that, Ukraine has to take Donetsk or Luhansk or both, or probably reconquer uh, the Crimea. Or alternatively, you have uh, such economic downturn because of the sanctions, because of the, let's say, sharp fall in the price of oil and gas, that Putin will not be able to sustain the regime uh, longer, which is, which is a long shot. Now, uh, can there be, and there's a question always, can there be some kind of... Um, some kind of internal uh, rebellion. And uh, Prigozhin's rebellion comes to mind. I want to stay here for a minute too. Um, anyone who says Putin is sick with cancer or Putin is going to live for another 100 years, uh, there, is, there are five plots against Putin. There are no plots. No one actually knows. Anyone who says it is either a provocateur or attention seeker or both. But what we do know from Prigozhin's, um, from Prigozhin's um, undertaking is that it did look, uh, make uh, Putin look weak. He was dithering, he delivered, in, he appeared on television late, he uh, delivered a rambling speech, which was um, five minutes of synopsis of Solzhenitsyn's The Red Will before he really switched to being commander in chief and president. Seven hours later, uh, the same people that were ordered to arrest Prigozhin and uh, nip the rebellion in the bud were told, oh, by the way, we fixed everything ha, 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 with Lukashenko. Um, for the regime, and by regime, I understand not Putin's close entourage, but hundreds of thousands, of millions of civil servants, vice governors, vice ministers, uh, regional FSB directors that run the country for Putin, for them, it was very clear that the man is not grasping it. And they will not forget it. In spite of the fact that Prigozhin was liquidated, we don't know by whom, but the perception, general perception in society is that it was Putin. The liquidation of uh, Prigozhin, I don't think it really compensated for Putin being irresolute on the day of the, uh, of the, of the rebellion. Moreover, the grotesque way of liquidating 10 people with what seems to be like an army surface-to-surface -surface missile, only in, to the smarter ones, shows that the man is so desperate to look strong that probably we should suspect that, in fact, he's weak. You know, as Margaret Thatcher, not a very favorite person in Ireland, I know, once said, if you have to say you're a lady, you're not. So that's exactly the thing, I think, with Putin and his vengeance, if it was his vengeance, on Prigozhin. But I think it is perceived that it, it was him who killed Prigozhin and punished him. Now, that may uh, turn off potential uh, potential mutineers, but if there is some kind of anti-Putin uprising in the future, in three years, five years, tomorrow, I think that those people who go for it learn the lesson. You go all the way and never believe Putin, because Putin basically will, will lie to you. And I suppose that in terms of the future, that's an important thing. But we are talking about today. Now, another calculation, and that is something that I bring from talking to my diplomatic sources and not only in, in Europe. Um, I think another Putin's calculation is that he needs to hold on until the American elections, because no matter which administration comes after that, it will overturn the the current policy of support for Ukraine. And I suppose that what I keep hearing since covering the NATO summit here in Vilnius is that this may come quite quite soon if uh, Joe Biden, and I keep hearing it all the time from different people in different capitals, if, if the current administration decides to lean on President Zelensky and uh, force him into some kind of quote-unquote peace or 
armistice or whatever, whatever you call it, ceasefire, probably the best one to call it. Uh, we can discuss it later. I do not think there is any kind of quid pro quo that Ukraine can get in such circumstances that will not satisfy Putin. Putin will be satisfied with that because he will just get time to, uh, you know, replenish resources to reignite or re 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 recreate maybe his uh, networks across the globe, including here in the EU, and um, eventually relaunch on his quest for, you know, subjugating Ukraine. Ukrainians, and, you know, there's much talk recently, and I'm trying to come to the conclusion. Um, Ukrainians are trying to, um, everyone's talking about Ukraine is tired, Ukraine, U Ukraine the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not um, as effective as, as, as um, uh, as we all expected it to be. Now, I'm not a military expert. My military experience uh, is limited to being first lieutenant uh, for three years during my national service. But what I can say is that um, I think that people in Kiev, and I understood it on my recent visit, understand perfectly well what Putin counts on, and that's demographic advantage. So I think that this um, use, increased use of high-tech weaponry uh, to offset the mass, if you wish, of, of Russians that attack Ukraine, I think it shows to be pretty, pretty effective. That's number one. At least it seems to be the main idea. Another thing is striking Russian mainland. I think that is a very smart move too. Um, and the more of that, the better it is for Ukraine, because that strikes at the heart of those people, those FSB directors, those vice governors, and so on and so forth that I described previously, those who are the bedrock of regime, because they have to deal with the consequences on the ground. And this is something they do not want to do. So I think that that brings the war to the attention of exactly the people that need to be paying attention to the war, and that is the Russian bureaucracy. If the Russian bureaucracy starts sabotaging this war, it will not be such a success. Such a, it, it probably will not last for long, frankly speaking. Uh, another thing that goes for Ukraine is, of course, motivation. Uh, Ukraine forces are better motivated to defend their motherland. However, that I can say with sort of a bit of my military experience. Of course, that changes over time. As we know, uh, even Russians that fight and fight fight at the front, if they survive, of course. Those who continue fighting uh, very frequently is, as in other armies uh, in history, they start fighting not so much for an idea or even for money, but for a friend, for example, that was killed or maimed. And this is a motivation, at least for some. So um, I think that this conflict will also be won on, on the superiority of morale. We should not forget that. That is an important part of warfare. And I think that uh, in this respect, um, to come to, to the conclusion, what we are looking at is essentially, and I'm not saying anything new, um, a competition of wills, a competition of political system that's also important. Uh, it is an open political system, maybe not a perfect one, but an open political, but a political system in Ukraine, in which the society is part, in many ways, of the decision-making process. And a society where everything is subjugated, everything works towards the goals of the state, and the best thing you can hope for is such a level of indifference that Putin will not be able to cope with it, but we're still far away from that. Uh, I suppose that, um, the last thing I want to say, I suppose that uh, this is an important moment for the West in this conflict, because uh, it is decision time, really, whether this is about international law, about the future of borders in Europe, about the future of the European Union and NATO, or whether it is only about containing Russia and making it safer for the rest of the world, i.e., okay, let's not be very harsh. Uh, Putin has nukes, so we shouldn't be too tough on him. Uh, let us go for some kind of compromise. 
I think, I can imagine, and we can discuss it, arguments for this latter position. But I think Putin proved many times that he cannot be trusted. So I do not think that uh, that this kind of old ideas from 1991 about Russia should be, they should be remembered, but I think they should not be used automatically. Today, it's a different Russia. It's a different regime. It's very different from the Soviet regime, and we can discuss it later. Uh, so, you know, do think twice. It's not all right. Thank you very much. Thank you.